Alrighty, guys, something a little different for today. So, I have been watching a whole lot of YouTube videos about how to become a good D&D player. Lots of the Brandon Lee Mulligans and Matthew Colvilles and Matthew Mercers and all those guys. Uh, I've tried to take all the information I've learned from each of their different videos. I've tried to culminate it and condense it down into one single video. One like lecture, one lesson plan. All right. So who is this for? This is for like begin, not straight beginners. If you've never role played before, you got to watch the 101 lesson, figure out what role playing even is, what it means to take the role of an elf or a dwarf and pretend to run around and want to kill orcs or whatever. But if you have played some D&D before and you get the idea of role playing, but you want to become better at role playing, then hopefully this can help you out. Like if you've heard of improv and you know that D&D &D has some improvisational theater elements in it, but like the extent of your knowledge of improv is that there's a thing they do called yes and, then hopefully this can give you a little bit more information and like uh, tactics and ideas from improv to sort of help you out in your role playing career. And not only are you just like new or not necessarily new, but not only do you uh, like have like a beginner's understanding of role playing, but you actively want to improve. If you are just okay with where you're at, then don't don't bother with this. Okay, so what's the general solution? What's the big idea as to what we're going to talk about here to change in helping you level up from mediocre role player to great role player. So change your lens. You probably think about things right now from the perspective of like, what would my character do? And then answer that question and then do that. But really you wanna think about things from more of a, what would make things more interesting in the story right now? And if you can sort of make that one general change, like what can I change about my character that will make this given scenario that we're in interesting, then that will just make your character, it'll give you opportunity for development and it will try to steer you away from having like a one note, one dimensional character and you'll be closer to having like an entertaining engagement with the world and with the other characters. And so the general uh, like idea of how you do this is by just having your character care about everything. He should, particularly whatever is going on at this very given moment, he should have a strong opinion regarding whatever is happening at this very moment. Just have him care. That's the, if, if you can get this idea down, uh, that's 99% of what I'm going to say here. And I'm just going to sort of give you some little tools that I've like come up with and heard about to try to help you to get into that mindset. Okay, so the pit trap of apathy. This is something that I find a lot of newer players fall into, is that you get the idea of like, oh, I can just play like a sad, emotionless robot and, you know, I, I can play a Warforge and just uh, not have to care about anything and think about everything from the perspective of an unemotional, feelingless robot. Like, that would be great. That's so easy. I, I can just answer everything by saying, like, I do not care one way or the other. It does not matter to me. I am just here. Which, on the one hand, you're right, it is really easy to replicate that. It's very, very easy to emulate apathy and be very consistent by playing an apathetic character. And so, yeah, you might get tricked into thinking like, okay, so that's a great idea. I, I will play the perfect version of my character by never doing something that he wouldn't do. I'll just always answer everything with be apathetic. But apathy tends to lead to very uninteresting, unentertaining scenarios. 
unless you're really good and you know how to use apathy. But if you just answer any dialogue if with just like like I I don't care, then the the dialogue is pretty much over. Like the other player or NPC or whoever you're interacting with can respond again by saying like, oh, but you really should care. I'm going to try to argue with you and maybe we can have a short dialogue about this. But if you've already set your mind on, I don't care, then there's nowhere for that dialogue to go. It's just, it's over as soon as you decide that you don't care. So generally I would say avoid apathy at all costs. Just always, always, always go with anything other than apathy. Just care about stuff in one direction or the other. Just don't decide, I don't care. But if your character is apathetic and you want to change that, or like, what if I do want to use apathy, then there are, there's like three outcomes that can conceivably occur with an apathetic character. You can either grow out of it, if you want to go the Travis Bickle, taxi driver, like Joker, men, Sigma male grind set mentality, start off as I'm depressed and I don't care about anything, but then you eventually come to learn to be passionate about something, then you're not really apathetic. Like it's more so just something that you're, you're not an apathetic character. Like you were once in your past. Uh, so, like, that's fine if you were apathetic and are no longer apathetic. You, you can work with that. That can go somewhere. Otherwise, if you are just apathetic from, un, you know, until you die, and, like, that's, you're not going to grow out of it. If you don't grow out of it, the only other option is you die apathetic. You know, if then, like, that's just a very tragic and sad story, which can be profound and it can be meaningful, but it's really difficult to pull off in a D&D type situation where you might be playing through a whole campaign, like 40 sessions where you just are depressed and don't care about anything. Like, you could probably get away with a session, like a one-shot where you're playing a character where your wife and children and everything you ever cared about has died and now you're just going to drink yourself to death or like do drugs until you die and you've already decided like I'm not growing out of this like I'm just going to die <sighs> like yeah, yeah you can make that meaningful you can make that entertaining I would stay away from it though it is hard to pull off or you can juxtapose it juxtapose the, pa the apathy with passion if you want to make a Squidward from Spongebob character who he doesn't care at all about his job and being a clerk and he just is very dismissive of everyone and everything, but you can tell that this apathy actually means something because when he's at home, he's playing the clarinet and he has this whole art and acting or whatever he does at his tiki house or whatever. And he, like, really has, like, a strong passion, and he's the complete opposite of apathetic, you know? So that, that juxtaposition makes that passion seem even that much greater because it is being contrasted against not caring at all about anything. Um, alternatively, you can have a sort of Eeyore situation where he's surrounded by Winnie the Pooh and all these super happy and passionate and caring people. And it makes them seem even more passionate and caring when they're put up against Eeyore, who is just super down and depressed about everything. So, yeah, you, you can use apathy. It is a tool at your disposal, but just be, you have to be surgical and very careful about its application. If you just broad swaths of apathy, it's just going to kill your character. And by kill your character, I mean not literally, but in the... It, they're not going to be a character anymore. They're going to just be a blank gray blob of nothingness. Okay, so for this lesson, I am going to make things simpler by just separating all role-playing into three levels. The passive, who is just happy to sit back and watch the story unfold. 
the keen who is actively trying, who is actively trying to put effort in and make their character or the story interesting. They just don't know exactly how to do this in such a manner that will make things entertaining. And the raconteur, this is the ideal. This is who everyone wants to be. This is the true storyteller. They are able to make, take any little situation and spin it into this golden thread of a story that just makes everyone care and can make any tiny little thing into a whole an emotional story and they can turn anything into character development. This is like ideally... Now, everyone can be a little bit of these things uh, depending on the circumstance. And, you know, like being a passive player, if you are a passive player, then like that's, and if you're okay with it, then, you know, great. I like this. As long as you're not detracting from anyone else's experience, then it's fine. But I find like most people that I talk to, like I think a lot of newer players tend towards the passive player side because it's safer. And some people say they're okay with being a passive player, but I think some of those people are lying. I think some of those people want to do better. They just don't know what to do in order to get better. Uh, and the raconteur, you know, some, sometimes you have to dial it back. You can't always be the raconteur, but you want to have in your arsenal. You want to have it to be able to pull out. You want to have those moments of being the raconteur. Uh, okay. So let's you do an example scenario just to show you what these different levels might look like. So how might the different levels roleplay this character? Generico the dwarf. He's got a very, very simple personality. He loves gold and he hates goblins. And that's the entire extent of what he is as a character. Okay, so let's put him in a situation. For whatever reason, he's trying to get to the other side of town and a black cat crosses his path. Uh, whether or not the DM had any like intention for this doesn't really matter. This is just the scenario that is being set in front of the player. So the passive player playing Generico the dwarf, well, he doesn't see anything. He doesn't see any explicit reason to actively interact with this cat. If the DM had wanted him to interact with the cat, then the DM would have forced him to do so. Uh, and since that is not the case, then this must be just set dressing. This is skippable. The passive player, you know, just like, let's, let's keep things moving. Like, I continue. Like, cool, neat, there's a cat. You know, I, I'm, I'm not detracting from anything, but it doesn't matter to me. Like, let's go on. Oops. Okay, the keen player. Uh, so they might have a little bit more of a th of a thought process rather than just like how do I keep things moving forward how do I like let's just keep the story going they might think well what would Generico do let me look at my personality traits okay Generico cares about gold he likes gold he wants more gold how can he use this to get gold uh well it's just a cat maybe I can try to catch it and then I could try to sell the cat you know maybe chop it up sell it as cat meat bits this is like a little goofy, a little silly, uh, but at least it's something. It gives the DM something to work with, and it's one note, it's one dimensional. You're not changing anything about Generico. You're not having him have any sort of conflict with himself or anything. Like, I guess there's technically a little bit of external conflict, and that now you are trying to actively run around and catch this cat. Uh, and you know, like at least you are more so establishing those personality traits of Generico, but it's not really leading anywhere. Like it's, it's okay. It, I think it would be better than the passive players, uh, you know, take on the situation. But, uh, you know, it's just a little uh, silly, a little goofy. It doesn't actually lead anywhere. Or like it could conceivably, this could at least is something for the DM to work with to possibly unravel into a whole you know its own whole story but in and of itself it, it's not much it's not ideal uh alternatively the, this could be uh looked at from the gameplay perspective maybe generico's player thinks 
oh, okay, black cat, that's got to be witch-related. Maybe this is a witch's familiar, maybe it's a witch in disguise. So how do I use this to help myself and or the party game-wise? Okay, what if we catch the cat and then try to bring it to a priest and then have him cast a spell on it or whatever to see if it is a witch's familiar? Okay, so this, like ties it into the story and, and or into the world to some extent which is cool which is you know good thinking i would say i i would reward this type of thinking if a player did this still not my ideal outcome because this is well any single player could have this thought this this doesn't have anything to do with the generico this is just a, the keen player making a decision without the personality of the dwarf coming into the the situation at all which again this is fine i would prefer this and reward this more so than just saying like let's move on but we can still do better uh okay so the raconteur how does the innate storyteller weave this into something well the first thing he thinks to himself is not how would generico react to this he thinks to himself, all right, what would be fun? Should I love or hate cats? Uh, let's just go with hate. You know, this is just an arbitrary decision that he is making in this moment. Now, okay, I need to come up with a justification. What is something that could have occurred in my past that is going to cause me to hate cats? And or what is something that has been established in previous sessions that could cause me to hate cats? Okay, uh, what if my father died in an accident? And the last thing anyone saw at the scene of the accident was like a black cat walking away. And like, great, that works. That's that's something. We're, we're adding to my character and this little piece of character building I have just invented is now going to actively come up in this very given situation, this scenario. So now the raconteur might say like, well, you know, whatever, however, since what happened to my father, I swear I would never cross the path of a black cat. So we're going to have to find another way. Now, maybe the raconteur here spitzball the idea of a gondola and a canal as another means of travel through the city. Or maybe this is something that the DM has established in the past. The idea that there is like an alternative and that I am now setting myself up for a conflict. Because now I'm going to have to choose the gondola or the cat. Well, like my obvious choice, I obviously can't go with the cat because I have this superstition. But the gondola is going to cost me gold. And that's part of my personality is that I don't ever, I, like I love gold. I'm not going to just throw it away willy-nilly on a silly little gondola ride where I could easily just walk across the town. But now I'm setting myself up for conflict, this internal conflict. I'm going to have to choose between my two ideals. Am I now choosing to pay the gold for this gondola? And am admitting to myself and to others that uh, this my black cat superstition matters more to me than the gold, or am I going to choose the the cat and like expressly tell everyone that I care more about the gold than the than my superstition? Either way, I'm going to have to make a choice, and then when I make this choice is going to set up for the future because now i know okay i've like uh, had a scene where i established everyone i really care about gold now when i make a choice about gold when i choose my friends over the ability to make more gold it's going to mean that much more to everyone else because i've proven how much i care about gold that i was willing to go over to you know, I, I'm going to cross my boundary of this, like, cat superstition before I spend gold. Uh, okay, so becoming the raconteur. So what are the step-by-step -step things you can take? The step-by-step, -step, uh, you know, decisions you can make, the questions you ask yourself in order to become the raconteur in any given situation. And it starts off by just having an opinion on something i break this down into you either love it or hate it now this could be broken down further into like do you fear it do you envy it 
you know, are, are you infatuated it? Like, what is the specific type of love or the specific type of hate that you have for this thing? And what is, and you're just choosing an arbitrary thing in the scene. Is it a person, a place, a thing, someone's idea about something, the, the situation that you're in as a whole, or a historical event that has some sort of context in this thing? Choose a thing, choose to either love it or hate it. That can all be arbitrary, uh, but then you have to justify it, which needs to be less arbitrary. The justification needs to be logical and rational. Uh, it needs to make sense with what you've already established with your character. All right, so what does the loving and the hating actually accomplish? Well, these are usually powerful and like usually rational feelings. You love or hate this thing for a rational reason, but then that love or hate causes you to make a decision that would otherwise be irrational. Like if you decide to not cross a black cat's path for no reason, then it means less like than if you had come up for a justification as to why you won't cross that cat's path. And you know, it, like it does happen in real life. Sometimes people just decide things and make decisions, irrational decisions, so for entirely arbitrary reasons. But ideally, we want to have real justifications for this. And ideally, when you do one of these things, when you make one of these decisions, you do so in such a sense that it causes you to make things harder for yourself. That you are now introducing an internal conflict and for a this situation that you're gonna have to now choose between and then when you make that choice you're planting the seeds for future growth because you've now you're established you've established how much you care about a given thing and now when you overcome that either that weakness you've set up for yourself uh, you know it, that's character development right there and that's really what we're shooting for is introducing as many opportunities for us to develop our character as possible and engage with other players because you can't have like a five minute internal monologue that's just not how DD works everything all information is expressed through interaction with other players there's not there's very very little of a visual medium to play with when it comes to DD. you will have to actively explain to other players how and why you're feeling the way that you feel and this is also an opportunity if you want to build a bond with another character you can either agree with their loving their love or hatred of a given thing or if you want to establish some sort of conflict with that other character you can come up with a reason for you to either do the opposite to either hate something they love or love something they hate uh, ideally to not such an extent that you guys are no longer going to be willing to work together as a party but just to have some strife and some conflict between the members uh, okay so a miniature painting analogy this might be more or less meaningful to given people but uh so there so improv storytelling is to tabletop level quality miniature painting as making a movie is to display quality. Now, so tabletop level quality, you maybe have 15 minutes to paint this entire miniature and it needs to be effective and everyone needs to be able to tell what this miniature is when they look at it from five feet away and that's all that matters. And the display quality miniature you might be working on this for three months because you know professional judges are going to be looking at it from every single tiny little angle and they are going to consider every single factor of this miniature. Uh, but when you look at both miniatures from five feet away, it doesn't matter. They, they, they are both the same from five feet away. You, you can tell that this guy is some like hulking mummy thing with scarabs. Um, but you can tell there's no mid-tones or shading or blend, or there, there is shading, but there's no mid-tones or blending or anything. I, everything is either a bright, bright highlight that's bright green, or it is 
this dark recessed shading everything is either like bright or everything is either dark everything is extremely clear you can look at this from far away and you tell what it is if you get up close to it eh, things start falling apart a little bit but that's fine because we we just need to be clear with our improv storytelling that's what's important you you've got you are writing a movie you are making an entire movie you're acting in it you're directing it you're editing it you're uh, you know you're coming up with the entire concept for the movie all in under a minute and you're doing all of these things at the same time um now yeah if we go back to the shading example with this guy you can tell there's white highlights and there's black shading just like in this mini there's white bright parts and black dark parts but this has super subtle and blending and things slowly transition from one color to another there's tons and tons of care put into the mid-tones and making everything exactly perfect this guy had the opportunity to write and rewrite and rewrite and have the script sent to a million different people and they each give him his their opinions and they can uh, you know edit it and change it and they have a million opportunities to make this absolutely perfect but that that's not what we're working with here you, you got a few minutes and you got to make it clear what's going on you have to be as efficient as possible with your time and with your storytelling be as quick as possible and be as like obvious as possible with the story you're trying to tell okay so embrace the lazy and cheap in miniature terms this is nuln oil you, you paint a mini quickly and you slather it in nuln oil it brings out the highlights it brings out the it's you know it brings out all the details instantly one minute you just slather it on and everyone can tell you know you, you took a bad looking mini and you made it into a good looking mini uh, like er, and now everyone can instantly tell the shapes and the colors and what that mini is supposed to be so what, what is the null oil of storytelling this is stuff that people have seen a million times flashbacks just be contrived abuse cliches uh, you know, this is not a script where someone is going to re read your screenplay and tell you, like, yeah, don't use a flashback halfway through. That's lazy exposition. Take that, move it all the way to the beginning, make it a part of the movie. You don't have to worry about any of that. You know, what you are concerned about is people getting the point of what you are trying to tell as quickly as possible. Like, if, if you have to say, like, as generico the dwarf maybe say like flashback to me looking at my father and seeing him falling from a railing and dying and then a, a cat looking over to me and then walking away like that's fine it, it would not be ideal if you're writing the great american novel and you're trying to make like a beautiful beautifully composed story like don't worry about that just use whatever cheap lazy storytelling methods you can to get your point across as quickly as possible okay so i have become theater kid now if becoming willing to act is a great and necessary step towards like leveling up as a role player like the the level one crook versus the 40 level mob boss the level one crook is okay with just saying like well generico the dwarf is very sad about this he's upset and crying and he doesn't like how this situation is unfolding that functions it works but it's not extremely efficient it's not it, you've got the one visual element to work with as a uh, as a D, D player you don't have access to imagery you can't do the citizen cane like having people sitting farther apart to show how you guys are growing apart like if you want to do that you have to tell people 
like, okay, hey, this is how I feel about you. Like, I, I don't like you as much as I did in the past. You can't have the baptism scene where you say you sit in a bath of water and come up and have been washed of your sins and you're now a new, different person. That, that's just not a visual, that's not like a tool you have in your toolbox as like a player in a D&D campaign. But what you do have is your emotion. And so if you want to tell people how you feel about a given situation, how your character feels about a given situation, then you, you can use your emotion. If you are sad, uh, like literally act sad. And if you are angry, act angry. And, uh, you, you know, we, you're humans. You have seen people who are sad before. You've seen people who are angry before. You know what sad people do. You know what angry people do. And there is a difference between movie acting and theater acting. In now in D and D we are using theater acting, but like in in movies you have the ability to get close ups of people. When someone is sad, a single teardrop can fall from their face, and you can pick up on it because you're seeing their entire face in the frame. And that might be much more realistic. That might be what an actual sad person would actually do in that situation. But we don't have that luxury. We are in uh, the theater here where you have to act and wave your arms around so that, you know, obviously, you know, if you're sitting in a theater, you, the people in the front row might be able to see a single tear falling down. I don't even know about that. I feel like even that you probably can't see that. But the people in the back definitely cannot see what's happening. So when you are sad, you have to do what sad people do. You need to, you know, hyperventilate, have a hard time catching your breath, wipe away the tears and like, you know, hold on and like, uh, you know, cl clutch your heart and uh, reach out. And you have to be obvious with your acting so that everyone else at the table can immediately tell what emotion you're expressing you don't have to win an oscar or an emmy or whatever it is you're not here for awards to truly convince people that you are actually sad you just need to express to the table like hey guys my character is sad how can i do that without just straight up telling the table that I'm sad, you know, let, let me show them that I'm sad. And so, you know, I, there's a little bit of, uh, like, it, it's a spectrum, you know, you, you can have the single tear falling down the face, that's just not enough, you know, everyone else is all busy with their own trying to express their own emotion and their own conflict and thinking about how can I react to this situation, they do not have the mental capacity to do both that and scan the table and look at everyone else, see who has a single teardrop falling from their face. It's just not enough. Um, and on the other side of that, don't go full mocking ironic. Oh, boo hoo hoo, boo hoo hoo. You know, that's just gonna come across as like disingenuous and insincere. You got to try at least a little bit, you know, like not, you know, bump it up like 75%, but like ham it up a whole lot, you know, really, uh, you, know, you know, it's fine. If it comes across as a little silly, don't bump it up to a thousand percent where it's just like, uh, where it seems like you're making fun of people who try to act. Uh, you know, it is difficult. I, I can't get into an entire lesson about how to be a good actor when this is the general crash course. And okay, so I've given you uh, like a lot of tools, a lot of things at your disposal here to try to uh, go for elements and moments of character development. And uh, you, you do not want to spam these. You do not want to go overboard. So don't make a decision that derails the story or brings the story to a halt. So if we go with the generico, the dwarf, don't then decide if you know 
the the gondola comes up as an option don't then decide well i also hate water because my mother drowned in a lake so i will never go on water i refuse to cross this cat's path i'm not going to go on the gondola i'm going to sit here and wait until the dm gives me another option you want to avoid that as to the much of your ability just if anything you want to be feeding out ideas and spitballing things that the dm can then use you you don't want to just shut down deny and block everything that is presented to you you, you want to give yourself choices and then make a choice not give yourself choices and then say no to all of them or bring the story to a halt don't go so much into your well, actually, I hate cats so much because of what my father did to me or what that cat I saw might have done to my father that I, you know, forget the story. Forget going to the other side of town. Like, I am going to sit in this city and I'm going to round up every single cat and kill every single one of them because I just hate cats that much now. That, that's going overboard. Don't, don't cause everything to grind to a halt or turn everything into a whole new story about you killing cats because you just decided that in this very moment okay just use it to and like embellish and add on to the current story don't don't use it to take away from everyone else and make your whole new story about this new thing and okay don't steal a spotlight if another player He's fighting the evil lich that killed his mother and his father and his brother. And now this is his moment to get revenge. And he's giving his monologue about there is good and evil. And I, yours is of the devil and mine is of God. And now these two grand forces shall meet and win will, good will win. Don't then step in and say, well, actually, this lich also killed my mother and brother, and I also hate this lich. And, you know, like, don't, uh, don't try to turn other people's moments into your moment. You know, let, let other people, when they're having their character development, just let them have their, their character development moment. Okay, and don't turn every character into a bipolar schizophrenic uh you know i've played my fair share of malkavians it is fun to play the occasional bipolar schizophrenic but if every single character you ever play is constantly flipping back and forth oh this session i love cats oh i only hate cats and because of this i love cats no i hate cats i love cats i hate cats i love cats i hate cats and there's no longer is it character development when you make that one final grand push when that one thing happens that causes you to finally overcome your superstition against cats and you've decided you're gonna help this wandering cat or whatever with his you know business whatever his cat thing he has going on uh, you know because it's meaningful when it happens once and if it happens a million times it just becomes like a mood swing that you're going through. Like maybe, maybe you can get away with the two, maybe even three back and forths. You know, do the old like double man in a hole, uh, like sort of character arc development where you care about it, you don't care about it, you care about it, you don't care about it. Don't constantly go back and forth. That'll just make it, it'll make the um it'll, it'll just like just like being apathetic it'll wrap back around to like instead of just not caring about anything ever for any reason now you care for an entirely random reason it just comes back to not mattering at all because as soon as your past stops mattering like you know a character is just the sum total of their experiences of their past and so as soon as that past stops mattering then the character stops mattering okay so developing nuance so being the raconteur is really not the hardest part of this i i've given you step-by-step -step instructions 
on to how to become the raconteur. So it'll take effort. You actively have to try. You have to put in that effort to get something out of it. You can't just, you know, if you're just a passive player and you never put in anything, then you'll never get anything out of it. Uh, but, you know, the nuance, the really difficult part of being the raconteur is knowing when to be the raconteur, knowing when to go all out into your story and monologue and add this thing about your past and this internal conflict and character development, when you should be engaging in that and when you should be stepping back and take the role of the passive player and just uh, like, you know, sit back for a second and either let someone else do their thing or let the story continue. Uh, so, okay. It can be hard to give yourself a disadvantage because this is a power fantasy. You you want to be a cool guy. No no one wants to be just like uh, like a paraplegic, you know, just like coward that sits in the tavern for their entire life and never leaves and just you know that that's not gonna make for a great party member for a campaign. Um, so you you have to like come to terms and like realize with. Okay, these are the things I'm willing to give myself a weakness for, and these things I am not. You know, are you willing to make your character a coward? Like, are you willing in a combat situation to just sit back and, uh, like, give yourself this conflict of, like, I need to run away? And, or, you know, so, so no, like, okay, if this is the situation, if this is the encounter that comes up, like, these are the encounters that I know I want to be a passive player in, and these are the conflicts that I know I want to be a the raconteur in. Uh, okay, so another thing you can do to just become better at the raconteur, to give yourself more opportunities to become the raconteur, the more stories, the more tropes you learn, the more times you can see a situation and realize like okay i can steal this thing from this other story and that would be a great opportunity for me to make this into a conflict for myself and you know he the the more you have in your toolbox the greater of a storytelling vocabulary you build for yourself the more often then you have the the chance to move from being the passive player to the raconteur and vice versa and the last thing, possibly the most important thing and the most difficult out of all of this is learning how to read the rooms. Uh, you know, are all the other players, are they trying to move on? Have you guys been haggling with the merchant for 30 minutes and you can tell everyone else is getting bored and tired and they want to stop this and just they just want to go on to the next part of the adventure? Uh, you know, that if, if that's the case, it's likely not the opportunity to, or that is probably not the appropriate time to break into your monologue about, I was a child and my father gave me two pennies to buy a loaf of bread. And now this merchant here, he tells me that, you know, don't, don't launch into the monologue about, you know, how, how you've had to deal with merchants in the past and, if people are bored and tired, they're like, I don't want to interact with this merchant any longer. Let's just keep this going. And that is not, this is like a broad, like general rule, I would say, like 99% of the time, I would say go with this. Like if you truly feel like you got a bombshell, if you got one ready in a chamber and you're like, all right, all right, I know everyone here is like bored and tired of this scene and wants to move on. But like when I add this new element to the scene, like, oh, it's going to bring people back. Like, this will be the thing that revives the scene. Like, if you think you've got something like that ready, go for it. I would say 99% of the time, read the room. People are trying to move on. Move on. The alternative, the, the opposite, this is as opposed to, uh, you know, are, are people having fun with the scene? Are, are tensions high? Is everyone, like, really engaged and sitting on the edge of their seat? Like, this is your opportunity to launch into your monologue and have people care and, like, sit there for the entire, you know, two minutes of you speaking. And it's really going to, you know, they're, they're engaged, they're ready, they're active, they, they want to see what happens next. You know, so they're paying attention to every single little moment. They, they don't want to miss anything. That's when you can launch into your 
your monologue about good and evil and, you know, let's fight this lich and, you know, let's really give it to them, you know, guys. And uh, so, uh, you know, I know the, the alternative to that, like 99% of the time, if things, if tensions are high and everyone is engaged and sitting around and talking and having fun, you want to keep that going as long as possible until it starts to become boring and then you, you move on to the next scene. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if tension has been running super high for such a long time that it has become the norm, maybe you want to do something to relieve the pressure, relieve the tension of that situation, and, you know, bring that dip back down so that there's a new contrast and that, like, when you go back to the scene being tense, it'll be just that much more tense. It's a dangerous game. 99% of the time, if things are tense... Don't, don't try to deflate it. Don't try to take it down. Just keep it running. Keep it going. And, okay. So a practical exercise. What, what's something I can do to try to teach myself this, like, raconteur instincts uh, in just my day-to-day -day life? Maybe when you're driving around or you're walking around or whatever. You can uh, just, like, look at a thing. Just choose a thing. Like, uh, my, you know, let's go with the bed. And, you know, you, you can think of something like, what does the bed symbolize? Like, you use it for sleep and, you know, rest or dreams or whatever. And so now just try to come up with something in your past that could cause you to either love that thing or hate that thing. So the bed. What's well, a reason I could love the bed? Maybe my dad owned a mattress store and I have very fond memories of going to the mattress store and jumping on the beds and having fun or whatever. Or maybe the opposite. Uh, maybe... Um, yeah, what's the reason I hate the bed? Okay, yeah, may, maybe I sat on a stone... I was in an oubliette locked in a dungeon for 20 years, and I had to sit and sleep on a stone-cold floor, and I got so used to it that like now I am physically incapable of sleeping in beds anymore. I like I have to sleep on the stone cold floor, you know, and that's something you, you, you could think of. I mean, that's from like, yeah, I forget where that's one from one of them books or whatever. Uh, okay, or you know, sleep. Let, let's look at the bed from the sleep angle. Maybe I love sleep because I w grew up in an orphanage, and I you know, was abused by the abbess or the monk or, I don't know, whoever runs an orphanage. And, you know, my only escape from that horrible, horrible life was when I got to go to dreamland, when I to went to sleep and I could finally escape that. Or maybe sleep, maybe I hate it because when I was a child, I was attacked by a dog who ripped my arm off, and now every time I go to sleep, I have traumatic nightmares where I get attacked by that dog again, and I try to avoid sleep to the best of my ability uh, because I, I dread it that much. You know, if you do that 10 million times with every single little thing that you see, then you will just have such a a perfect great instinct for being able to just come up with things that just come up over the course of the game just out, out of the blue you know it'll be very impressive when you break it out uh, okay so uh, that's the uh, that's basically everything if you can take all these steps so you know in conclusion turn the mundane into the extraordinary you and your party party are taking camp making camp for the night uh, you know, how, how can you turn this otherwise boring, mundane thing into some sort of conflict? You know, like, what, what is something that you and another player can either agree or disagree on or have thoughts about given this camp? Um, maybe where you are, what's going on actively, like the situation, any of those things, just any, any, you know, if there hasn't been any character moments, character development for a while, Turn, turn something mundane into something extraordinary. Okay, make less work for the DM. What, like, is what you're doing, are you spitballing ideas, throwing stuff out there that will add fuel to the DM's like fire, gives them more to work with? Are you giving them like more tools in their arsenal to play with? 
or are you putting stuff out? Are you shutting stuff down and like forcing them to come up with new stuff to allow you to do your thing? You know, you, you should be making decisions that give them more to work with and you should ideally not be creating situations to give the DM less to work with. Okay, exaggerate your emoting, you know, when you're sad or happy, make sure everyone, if you want people to be able to tell that your character is sad or happy, you know, make sure you let people know that you are sad or happy. And uh, Okay, generally, all right, uh, choose a thing, love it or hate it, you know, and make this a rational reason. I mean, create a rational reason for why you love or hate a thing. Then make your love or hatred for this thing, cause that to make you do some something irrational. Uh, or, you know, that would be irrational if you did not have that love or hatred for that thing. Okay, give into your intuitive sense of storytelling. Just consume as many stories as possible and just steal from them constantly. Just constantly steal stuff from books and movies all the time. And, you know, it'll become your own thing if you steal a million different little other works and then culminate them into your own one work. Now it's become your thing. It is no longer a million little things. Okay, so occasionally use encounters as an opportunity to give yourself a weakness, a disadvantage. Don't rely on the 5e background flaw. Like, that can be a good jumping off point as, like, a flaw but if that's like your one and only flaw, and then it's going to be your one and only flaw forever, then that doesn't help you develop your character at all. That's just, you're, you're now a character with a flaw. You know, you, you need to be able to change. You need to be able to, you probably need a whole lot of flaws, and you need to constantly be learning from them. And like, you need to constantly have a whole bunch of flaws. You need to be constantly getting over those flaws. Uh, if all else fails, watch Harmon Quest on whatever it's on and try to emulate Dan Harmon because he, he's like a great natural storyteller with this stuff. And when I say emulate him, obviously I don't mean don't emulate his creepy women stuff. Emulate his storytelling. And alrighty, uh, that is it. So, you know, hopefully this has helped someone. Uh, Peace out.